and I'm going to be the moderator. I am a jurist and I work on transitional justice and the whole topic of this of in Zohrot. We are a civil society that works over the last 13 years in order to raise the Jewish public's awareness for the Palestinian Nakba and the actualization of the return, the right of return as an amendment, as a rectification of the Nakba as part of shared life here in a democratic society in Israel. I came from Haifa today. My partner is Igal and our three children. Neve is 13, Ohad is eight, and Asif is a year old. This morning, I kissed them all, crying in their beds this morning. Nice, warm beds, but a kiss with tears, as I thought on the train, are from the personal realm to the perhaps the more public and then the national and to something and how it, it was intermingled. And the thought about the past and how one fragments myths and a yearning for a possible future here together for our children, for Palestinian children, for Jewish children and for those who are non-Jewish in this space. We are trying in our humble ways at this hearing, at this event today, to try and impact the historical past and move it, the impasse basically, and move it from despair to hope. And I wanted to tell you that this Truth Commission was convened a few months ago. And this is the first public hearing. It was established over two years of real exertion of efforts uh, with a plethora of people who were involved, both Jews and Palestinians together. This project was established, was established by Debbie Faber and she harnessed more than 30 volunteers who worked with the Zohar team in order to establish the Truth Commission and to enable its work, as you will see today. I would like to thank Debbie from the bottom of our hearts to make this happen. Thank you to our volunteers from Israel, but and from the South, most specifically, that have accompanied it, not only in thinking, but also indeed from its very primordial days. And also the, the, the witnesses and everything that was written down, the testimonies and the support with such love and affectionate. And uh, the, those who, from the academe who've actually supplied and provided time and so many others. A tremendous vote of gratitude to Neva Greenzweig, who you will see with her great mane of curls running around, who's been producing this entire process until the absolute nitty gritty with such devotion in order to allow anyone to be, everyone to be free and available. And she's been working very intensively with me over the last few months because it's really the first very challenging, very moving and loaded event. And thank you very much also to the Leonardo Hotel who have hosted us in such a distinguished manner. And Liad Rosenblum, who is a director of Zohrot, who allow, enables us this political kind of spaces and all that brave team in Zohrot. And, more than anyone, I would like to thank the witnesses who have come here today, the men and the women, who are the most important people in the room today, throughout the day, and they will continue coming throughout this day and the various sessions. This entire public hearing is designated inter alia to recognize their narrative that they would like to bring to this stage. And at the end of these thank yous, a uh, tremendous appreciation to the Truth Commission, who are all volunteers. They're sitting here on the presidium at the beginning of, at the, the front of the hall. They're, from, they're activists from the actual academe and from the field. And they are working in a way that is totally unprecedented. 
I would like to present them one by one. The chairman of the commission is Dr. Nua Reish, who is a sociologist of education from the, educa from the School of Education at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And for the last few years, she has focused on various perceptions of justice, um, for example, legal and other kinds of justice. She's been at the watch, the the block watch and yes dean and in a new movement that has been established called women making peace nashim osot shalom the second chairman of the commission who will open just after me is shechda ibn berry who is a jurist a lawyer who is very active, active fighting for the rights of the Palestinians, the Bedouins in the Negev, and the various structure, the various struggles against the Prava programs, and helping with other displaced person programs. And I would like to also present here Dr. Munir Noseba, who is teaching at the Faculty of Law at the Al Quds University and serving as a director of the Human Rights Clin Clinic and the Community Action Center there at Al Quds University. Mm -hmm. Professor Avnail Ben Amos, who is an educational historian, teacher at the, Hebrew, at the Tel Aviv University in education, deals in research on education for citizenship and the molding of the collective memory in France and in Israel. He's a member of the Coexistence Forum in the Negev and also in the board of directors of Amnesty International Israel. I would like to also present Huda Abu Ayad Obayad, the youngest member who was born and lives in Lakia in the Negev. She runs the Yasmin, the Negev, um, for the health of the family and for women, and has really been exerting every effort, um, uh, working against, struggling against the Prava programs, working in the raising of awareness of Bedouin Palestinian women for what the various displacement programs are and the Prava programs. Project. Dr. Erela Shadmi, who is a peace activist and also a feminist um, researcher who deals in the research of women and feminism on motherhood and the social um, logic and research of police and policing. And last but not least, Vasim Birumi, a psychologist, over the last 16 years has been active in various um, frameworks around the world, um, very active in on the topic of the Arab-Jewish conflict and education for peace and social justice. I would like to thank one and all and for the team who've come with the witnesses to accompany them who are just sitting over here with us. I'd like to actually present Ilana Senesh, Judy Roth, Ilan Zoabi, and Badel who is also a male nurse. So we have a member of the medical corps here with us. And they are accompanying our witnesses, and they have been trained to do so. Now I would like to conclude with a few technical details. This is a discussion on the Truth Committee Commission that is open to the public. And we are inviting you to see one of these deliberations that already convened three times in the past. And which will continue convening, but not at public hearings. The audience, therefore, are spectators. This is not a conference. The audience has come to hear and to honor the witnesses and the commission and to hear what they have to say. We are aware of the fact that these are very complex, challenging, and very sensitive, loaded topics, ma making us think so many complicated co um, thoughts and take stands and feel emotions about what we call the situation, the conflict, the war. It is reasonable to think that during those testimonies, there will people will feel a need to ask questions. But, 
because this is such a complex hearing, we took into account that we would not enable questions during the actual hearing, but only at its end. But in order to be able to meet those needs and to hear various reactions and some kind of evaluation from the audience for what we did today, actually at the reception outside, there's a little box with paper and pens, and you can write down not only the details, but you can actually write down questions, queries, comments, so that we can continue being in touch with you. At the end of the day, there's going to be a short session that's going to be open to the audience. It was supposed to be at 6.40 in the evening. It might be brought forward, but it'll definitely be at the end of all the sessions before the concluding remarks. There are various role players that actually have tags, and you can approach them and ask them things if you need to. People cannot leave in the middle or come in at the end. And if anyone needs any refreshments, please could you actually honor us by waiting till the end of the session. If anyone has actually arrived late, they have to wait outside until the end of the session. There's str live streaming going on on our Facebook page that is actually broadcasting the, the event. So you can now send a message in the next minute or two by SMS to anyone you want to be watching. It is the Truth Commission hearings of Zohrot. And then please could you put all your phones on vibrate. Please could you respect the honor and the dignity of those participating. And please, if possible, I would like now to invite Sheikh Ibn Berry to address us as an opening in the opening session. <coughs> thank you very much, and thank you very much, Dana. I'm delighted to open the public hearing of the Truth Commission that will explore the responsibility of Israeli society for the Palestinian Nakba in the Negev, most specifically. And that stress is on the years between 1948 and 1960 in the South. Dr. Nora Rish are heading this commission. No, Dr. No Arish will be, conclude the day. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Truth Commission and this initiative and what we have done up to now and what we will do following it. With, uh, I mean, we have done so with tremendous vacillations. After all, it is very complex, very loaded. And I will relate a little bit to the issue of the witnesses that are with us today. They are the, the most important people in the work of this commission. We respect them. They are the central core of the narrative. And at the end, I will give you a historical survey very brief one about what happened in the Negev from 1948 till 1960. The commission is a really welcome, it's a blessed initiative, and one must congratulate and wish them strength to the Zohrot organization because they want to raise the awareness of the Palestinian Nakba, and for that I thank them personally. But as well, I would also like to say that they're not independent. They do work with Zohrot, but they're not subject to their dictates. They try to do so in an independent way. In South Africa, the formal ones and the other commissions around the world, this is somewhat different because it starts acting while the conflict and its conclusion, unfortunately, is not in sight. We're, talk we're dealing with racism and the escalation of violence and other things. We're trying to find um, truth and justice and rectify the situation in civil society. It is a commission of activists, people from the field. 
And as Dana said, this commission is of activists, people who really are in the field. It's not a state commission or something that commits other people or that was appointed. It can only come out with various declarative um, sort of comments or recommendations with the hope that it will be heard, that it should be internalized by civil society in Israel, by society in Israel. We believe and are optimistic that this process is extremely meaningful and significant to every single citizen of the state of Israel. Yes. We know that some of the members of the committee say that this should be a neutral commission. But with all due respect, and we're saying chapeau to neutrality, but it's not neutrality in order to deny, neutrality that denies the Nakba. No, with that we agree wholeheartedly, unanimously. The recognition of the Nakba and the ongoing Nakba with all its various issues embedded in it, the issues of the displaced people and the refugees, we will talk about. We've had three meetings up to now that were closed in camera wherein we discussed what our mandate is and what we intend to do. And we have actually taken testimonies from various peoples and we will continue to do so. This is the only public hearing. It's very possible that we will have a decision about an additional one, wherein we will hear about the Nakba today in the South from those who fought in 1948 and for those who were displaced in 1948, and not only in 1948, but also post-1948. After this hearing, after this event, we will meet a number of times in order to draw conclusions to be implemented as a commission. And of course, each person can separately, personally draw conclusions according to their degree of their conscience. The Nagba in the Negev is not really sort of the facts about it, are not known to the public. And I think that I believe that perhaps because of forgetfulness, um, this has affected them so badly, everything, and their voice has also become lost, those here, the Bedouins and abroad. First of all, in order to deal with anything, there needs to be a recognition that could lead to justice. After that, you can talk about rectif rectification, tikkun. But we want to hear it as first source from the actual people who will tell their personal stories, their narratives, that, that they experienced or saw or felt, so that these testimonies will turn into a credible um, and not politically sort of biased in any possible way. We're going to focus on those events that took place from 1948, continuing all the way through to 1960. Most of the public, the lion's share of them, did not know, do not know what they experienced in the South. They don't even bring it up for a discussion. They are silent about it in order to perhaps just completely ignore it or deny it to themselves. And just one word about the word reconciliation. We do not believe that this commission's aim is to bring about any kind of reconciliation. Because that is something of people who, where there is equality between them that need to after perhaps make amends after many years of conflict. We're not there yet. Reconciliation could be made between people, uh, that there are equality between them, and but the conflict is still ongoing, and therefore we can't use that word. But uh, alongside that, the hope for a better present and future, and a future reconciliation is definitely the wish of all of us. This could be a model 
perhaps for a mediation or a resolution of the problem in the future for all those who understand the, the actual dimensions, the roots of that tragedy for those who are in the refugee camps in Sinai, in the Gaza Strip, in Jahalin, Jerusalem, in the Dead Sea areas. We cannot reach any understanding or reconciliation that we can see as a flicker of light in the future. But the people are, we're going to hear additional testimonies of activists, of historians, of uh, peoples from the academe, and people who actually, and who also witnesses, and other documented testimonies that were collected over the years. But today, this is going to be first person, first source. And we would like to thank those witnesses that we're going to hear today, for those who have come today, and for the displaced refugees from 1948 for their bravery, who have come from every corner of this country to tell their truth. Their, their, their effort is what is paving our way to reach that truth. The witnesses today are the most important people. We will do everything so that we will show how we feel towards them and respect them and honor them and put them in central position. The witnesses lived that period. There's no greater expert of that period other than those who actually experienced it personally. I would like, because time is of the essence, and there is so much more to say, just to tell you in brief a little bit about what happened in the Negev from 1948 that is ongoing, was ongoing until at least 1960. But as you know, in 1948, at the end of 1948, October, Beersheba was conquered, was occupied, and the army went towards the south. And then a decision was made that they would expel all the Negev residents from Israel. At the end, Ben Gurion decided, and he sort of, that he would leave 10 percent, perhaps even less. 10,000 of the Palestinian Bedouin Arab inhabitants within Israel. Only there was an additional decision, and that was about where should they be settled. First they spoke about West Beersheba, and then they said East Beersheba, and in the end the decision was made that they would close them in an eastern part of the Beersheba town between Arad, Dimona, and Beersheba. There were additional decisions about expulsions, of expulsions of entire tribes, even with shooting. Yes, people were killed, people were evacuated while pushing them into the eastern part towards Jordan, some south, more southern towards Sinai, and all the attempts of the United Nations, various or refugee commissions to bring them back were unsuccessful, except for a number who were allowed to return. And that is when this whole turmoil started of the Negev. On one hand, they were in closure. One hand, it was a military kind of detention. There were deaths. There were diseases, mortality because of disease, because of morbidity, and various infections, epidemic, epidemics. To such a degree, the United Nations started intervening because of the situation, because of this mortality rate in the Negev. I think that the last event was in 1959 with the biggest um, expulsion of the, of the inhabitants towards um, Sinai with a, a, dec a declaration of Ben-Gurion publicly that these inhabitants are um, telling tales and they are informers to the e Egyptians and therefore they, don't, they are not wanted here. I sincerely hope that this will be a successful day and we will continue our work and we will update the witnesses because they are the most important to us. We cherish them and we will continue with that work and we sincerely hope that they will also be 
um, they will receive a vote of gratitude from Israel's public as well. I would like to say that now we're moving on to the first session of the day, which is the testimonial segment of the day. And I would say that of all of the sessions of today, this is the most, uh, this is the shortest. And uh, basically, witnesses will each uh, come and uh, say their part. So. We would ask all of those attending, keep quiet. Please don't come in and out of the hall. We don't have a lot of time, and we've had to change the schedule in the last minute. So uh, it happened that this is going to be the shortest uh, uh, session, and this will, of course, impact the testimonies. I want to invite to the stage Ed Nuri Badash, who's going to uh, be talking with Zalman Oshi and Noura Resh, who is the chairperson of the committee, and she's going to be interviewing all of the uh, Jewish witnesses right now. Tsofen. Uh, Tsofen. We thank you very much for the effort and also for the courage to come and tell us your story. I would ask first that you give us a bit of details about you. Well, we've said that your name is Tsofen. Can you tell us where you were born? Where do you live today? Yeah, a bit of information about you. Hello to everybody in the uh, hall. I'm a bit, you know, excited and, and nervous to be here. I. My name is Tsufin. That's my nickname, actually, from the days before the establishment of Israel. And I'm a member of the Chatzirim Kibbutz. I came to the Negev in 1946. That's a bit of information that I can give you kind of in a nutshell. You said earlier that you were born in Israel. Yes, I was born right here in Tel Aviv, yes. I was uh, a Tel Aviv resident, and at the moment now I live in the Chatzarim Kibbutz. I came to tell you about my participation in the independence war. Okay, then uh, we're going to ask you. We apologize ahead of time for the time limitation that we have, but if you could try to focus your remarks most particularly on your participation in the war, to the best of your recollection, here in the south, in, right here in this area. I was in the Negev Brigade in the Chayot Negev platoon, if you've heard about this particular unit, we fought against the Egyptian army, uh, ex against the Egyptian army. I participated in all of the battles in the Negev region here in the desert. And I am going to mention a few particular battles that I participated in. But apart from that, I understand that there's a problem here uh, that we uh, basically uh, ran off the Arab residents from their homes. And I completely come against this, this uh, allegation because we, our brigade at least, my brigade that participated in the independence war, fought specifically only against Egyptians. So I think that one of the things that, I mean, I won't say the chronological uh, sequence uh, that we uh, fought in, in maintaining the water uh, pipes from Mirav that brings water to the entire Negev region, to all the kibbutzim here in this area, the people who settled here. There was absolute damage that was done week by week, where they fought, uh, they uh, actually fired into the pipeline so that we would be left without water, and we were in fact left without water. And in regards to the relations of the kibbutz with the local uh, residents, I have to say that we live not far from here, meaning our, our settlement is very very close to the Be'er Sheva Wadi, which w there is a well there, and that's where we got our water and bought our water. Uh, and uh, and over, the uh, over the well, there's the settlement of Abu Ichye. And I remember that well, because it still exists till today. Now, in regards to the war, this issue of 
The, uh, the siege of the Negev that was between the Ashkelon area, the city of Ashkelon, to Hebron, meaning there's a road from Ashkelon to, to Hebron, and the Egyptian army controlled this uh, piece of land, and we fought against the Egyptians in order to release access and so that we could reach the north so that we could get food so that we could get uh, uh, maybe uh, a chance for people and allow people to move people from place to place now i participated in the uh, iraq sudan uh, battles where the egyptian army uh, sat there was uh, present there my brigade W went seven times there and fought seven times until we managed to conquer that uh, that fort. I'm not going to tell you the absolute dates because I just don't remember them. Afterwards, my brigade um, <coughs> fought to. <coughs> get control of the Yitzchak wells, which, where there's now the Kibbutz Alumim uh, and the Beri Kibbutz at the mo and, and we fought battles there again against the Egyptian army that tried to move forward uh, northward and did manage to do so all the way until Avodot uh, Chai. We participated in the defense of the Nitzanim Kibbutz and uh, other settlements in the region. And what I would emphasize is that our war was not against local residents, people who lived in the various villages, not in Be'er and not in Kaukaba and not other settlements uh, that I won't name all of them at the moment because there was, there was a, a, a respite, a lull in the war. There was a time of quiet. We were sitting next to, we were camped at, near Kaukaba. Kaukaba was a Palestinian settlement. Yes, yes, of course. Kaukaba was a Palestinian settlement, and we, I'm saying it in Arabic, it's Kaukaba, that's what it was called. And we, my unit was camped very much near the Arab settlement, and the Egyptian army came to Kaukaba, and we were literally there, so we saw all of it, and took the Palestinian uh, residents and evacuated them for the, and, and, and set them off. Because. <laughs> They thought maybe, I don't know, they thought that we, the, the Jews, would do something to them, I don't know, but that wasn't the point, that wasn't what we were doing at all. That's what I would m m talk about, this specific site. Again, not because I'm coming to justify our actions that we are, w w you know, but in this particular, this war, w the, the ones that are, the battles that I and my entire brigade participated in, we were never aware of any kind of evacuation of people from their homes. I, or expulsion. I got to Be'er Sheva. Uh, this battle was something that I participated in, in a very minor role. But what I can say about taking over Be'er Sheva, that after we conquered this area, after we took control over Be'er Sheva region, there was a looting of the entire area, of the entire uh, residents of Be'er Sheva because everybody had ran or well, run away from their homes because the Egyptian army had thrown people out of their homes. Very few people even remained. <coughs> and the fuel that we used to drive the vehicles to Be'er Sheva, we would buy in Be'er Sheva. And this was no longer possible after the battle. Looting by whom? Who, who looted Be'er Sheva? <laughs> Jews. Jews looted Be'er Sheva. The city was abandoned. <laughs> Meaning when your brigade entered Be'er Sheva, you found it desolate, uh, an empty city? W no, it's not that we found the city without residents, but uh, what was abandoned was mostly the areas of the old city of Be'er Sheva, which were storage houses, of, uh, you know, stock and inventory, you know, tractors and other vehicles, whatever. And, and around the city, there were the residents. They weren't harmed and nothing was done to them. You mean the original residents? Yes, yes, the, the, the native residents I'm talking about. 
Can you maybe tell me something about how you feel today about those events? I feel today very bad, not because I, I, I feel bad because over the years I worked in Hebron. I was a member of Eged and I managed the Eged branch in Hebron and the, my role was basically to drive uh, the residents there to work in Be'er Sheva, Arad and Dimona. And so I had really good relations over the years. I saw I was in Daria, and from then we all brought all of the buses, all of the Arab uh, uh, residents. I took them to work in Israel. So you're talking about the period after 67, yes. Because Hebron only at the time, yes, 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 I fed you. You asked me to give you the since then. So yeah, I'm talking about the time after that. That was in 1965. But that's what I have to say about that. If I have more time, I'll give you more information. Well, no, actually, I think we have to conclude. I thank you very much. OK, OK. Questions, I'm sorry, yes. Is there anybody, any member of the committee that would like to ask maybe questions? Shahde and Uda. And then Wasim, and finally Lerela. Please briefly, ask briefly people, because we really are short on time. And what period did you enter the city of Be'er Sheva? Do you remember the, the date or the... Were you outside the city, inside the city? Were you part of the forces that took over the city? Do you recall exactly the period? I can't tell you the date. No, I, I don't remember that, but... But when you entered the city of the Be'er Sheva, were the soldiers still there? Uh, I... Noah has to repeat the question because people asking questions aren't doing so into a mic. The question was, when you entered the city of Be'er Sheva, did you already find soldiers who had been there earlier before you? Were you the f no? The Egyptian army, the Egyptian army was si was camped in Be'er Sheva, and we went to take the city from the Egyptians. It's true that there were residents, people living in the city. It was actually a relatively large city, Be'er Sheva. I, I, at the enti my entire brigade participated. What brigade? A Negev, the Negev brigade. Like I said, okay, okay. <laughs> Shahde is, is saying, I'm just going to reiterate what Shahde said so that people can, everybody can hear the question. Shahde is saying, is asking you basically, do you know of, I mean, there's something that he heard where the story was that the residents of Be'er Sheva were concentrated during the taking of the city, they were concentrated in a mosque. And there was use of firepower, meaning they were gunned down or, for, uh, or shot. I have to admit that, uh, wait, is my mic working? I have to admit that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, I did, I, I never, I don't, never heard of that and I didn't participate in anything. And this is the first time I've ever heard of such a story, in fact. Okay, Huda, you're next. <laughs> if you could just speak up. I, I can't explain it. I, you have to, rep I, the, oh, sorry, sorry. The question was, Huda asked, I mean, if you're saying that all of your, your battles in the Negev Brigade were only against the Egyptian military, how can it be, how do you explain the fact that there are so many refugees from this area who are now in refugee camps. How did they become residents of Be'er Sheva and then refugees if you didn't do it? 
from what I uh, from what I think, what I know, the Egyptian army made sure uh, was thinking of their welfare, thought that we, the Jews, are coming to maybe kill them. But this was, of course, not the case and not our objective. In fact, quite the opposite. We were very much aware of the fact that we are not supposed to harm anybody. We are only trying to get rid of the Egyptian presence in the area. That was our agenda of the Negev Brigade. Now, if uh, Arabs were hurt here or there, I don't know. I can't tell you about it because in my brigade, the one that I was active in, we, we didn't harm any Arab uh, village or settlement. It's not because I'm here to apologize on anybody's behalf. I'm not afraid to apologize. Had I done anything wrong? But I'm, I'm saying I... And I've lived many, many, many years. Uh, so, I mean, we were, I lived two years here in the Negev before the war, and we had, uh, uh, and we had uh, relations with the many Arabs uh, and settlers around us in the kibbutz. That we had lots of Arab neighbors around us that came, uh, Bulgariak and Abu Ikhye, and they would come to our kibbutz, and we had another guy who uh, knew how to uh, speak Arabic from uh, infancy and he would uh, greet them and he could talk openly with them and people used to talk and say it's going to be good and that the Jews are going to provide them employment and things of that nature. Please, please briefly because there are two people who want to ask after you. How do you feel about the looting of Be'er Sheva? You say that there was looting? What do you feel today about this, this action, the, this looting? Do you have any thoughts of how you should have acted, what it was right, what was wrong? In light of the looting of Be'er Sheva, how do you feel today? Are you looking back on it now? I must say, is that, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I must say that the looting was done most specifically in abandoned areas. I emphasize the word abandoned. But uh, there were warehouses there of uh, wheat and tractors and uh, all sorts of things that uh, people came and took. Looting is certainly not something that ever to be proud of. I mean, it's always an unjustified act, but there was nobody to talk to at the time, even if we wanted to do it to address it, because we, as, as residents of Chatserim, we came to Be'er Sheva to, to buy fuel, to buy bread and pitot. Uh, we had great relations with the people who lived here in Be'er Sheva. So... And, and when I, during the war, obviously I wasn't st in my kibbutz, I, wasn't, I, I was stationed in all sorts of places, but after the war in 1948, no, 49, after the uh, Be'er was abandoned, there was no point to, to, f to leave the tractor or whatever was fight about it. There's nothing, who exactly would, would, be fi you would, would you be fighting with? No, I'm not joking with you. You're, 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 you're smiling. It's not funny. It was just what it was. No, no, no. no, I'm sorry. You can't ask another question. You can't. I'm sorry. Because we have two more. Nisam and then, sorry, we'll see my, sorry. <laughs> I have two questions. If you could take earphones, please. Yes. I haven't spoken Arabic since 1974. I'm sorry, guys. Do you feel that there's a, these are inevitable events, or? One first question. Do you feel today that these were inevitable events that couldn't have been stopped? I 
I came here today not to apologize and not to... I just wanted to see this variety of people that <clears throat> all want to reach a point of, of, of talking together, of living together. This is something that okay, it was of interest to me, not because I, I belong to this group. I, I just wanted to see what's happening. And so I agreed to testify. And when, they, when somebody came to me and I told them everything that I've told you, if you and I, maybe they gave this person who interviewed me with greater detail, then they asked me to come. Yeah, I Afterwards, when I worked in the Hebron area for uh, about three years, I had relationships, very good relations with people, despite the fact that today I don't speak Arabic anymore. At the time, I did speak Arabic and enjoyed very much uh, this uh, my relations with also with all of the people. Okay, last to speak is please Erela. We have more time. Okay, okay, great. Then Erela and then Munir, please. First question in regards to looting. Who looted exactly? Who's the one who took out the the uh, inventory from the warehouses? Second, you you fought as you said against the Egyptian military. If during the battles before, during after, did you meet or encounter local Palestinians? And were you given any instructions, commands on how to, to treat the Palestinians if you met any? What happened if you did? <laughs> And this first, this the first question is who looted, and the second question was, did you have, did you encounter local residents, and were you given any commands ahead of time, instructions ahead of time, on how to treat these local residents? I have to admit that that my kibbutz members were among the looters. The, but all, people also came from all over Israel. People came when they heard that Be'er Sheva had been abandoned. There were no people there. And uh, the city is empty. People came from all over with trucks and took as much as they could from everywhere. Now, what was the second question she asked? If within the battles that you conducted against the Egyptian military, did you also encounter, meet uh, local Palestinians? We, at least in the brigade that I served in, Earlier, I said that we're in Kaukaba and Brer and all sorts of other areas. Places where we were shot at, we shot back. Places where we weren't shot at, we sort of skipped ahead. Uh, Brer, for example, one of the villages, Kaukaba. These are the two villages where uh, I camped near these settlements, and we never entered these settlements, ever. So that's why I'm saying we skipped over them, because our objective was to release the siege on the south. That was our key objective as the Negev Brigade. One last question. Munir wanted to.
questions. The first question is, historians say that Israel did not allow the return of refugees back to their homes. Were you part of this? Did you see this? Did you witness this? People, the, the Israelis did not allow the return? This is regards to the return of people back to their homes. Uh, various historians claim that the state of Israel that the Israeli policy was to prevent people who had either run away or been been uh, been uh, uh, taken away from their homes, forced away from their homes, not allowed to return. Or did you see this? I fought up until the taking over of Be'er Sheva afterwards, no. What happened later, I have no idea. I don't know what happened after the battle. Again, it's not because I'm coming here to sort of uh, sort of uh, maintain my purity and act as if we're all pure and mighty and noble. I don't know. What I can say is for sure that we are a very merciful people, the Jews. And, uh, and I could see this, and we saw this as well. How do you see the last operation? Uh, protective edge in the last summer. Protective uh, the operation Protective Edge, there was a clear instruction not to harm civilians. What was your second question? Shh. The witness and uh, was asked and, and to answer to the best of his knowledge. It doesn't matter if you disagree. Please do not react and respond right now, people. <laughs> I'm sorry, my Arabic is gone. It's gone. I'm really, I apologize. I really wish. The second question had to do with what you think on the right of return generally of Palestinians to their homes. <laughs> She's just reiterating the question. What do you think about the right of return? I must say that one must distinguish between questions which are uh, questions that are directly addressed to the Truth Committee and those who want to give first um, hand testimony of what I saw, what I did, where I participated, what I encountered, what I know personally, and between the expression of, of opinions, such as how do you feel, what do you think in regards to the future, what do you think about the right of return. Y you can answer the question, sir, but I, I just want to make a distinction between questions that have to do with testimonials and questions that have to do with your general feelings and opinions. I, I can answer the second question. Can you hear me now? I have no well, no way to answer your second question because it's a political question. I am for the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. This is what I can tell you. Apart from that, it's all politics, and I don't want to get into politics. Thank you. We haven't got time for more questions. Okay, one, but really under pressure. Ask the question. Did you explode houses or were you a witness? Or where people were expelled? That's an excellent question, but just in order first to translate it. Were you present or did you participate in or did you witness the explosion of houses, the demolishment of houses after the occupation of Beersheba? It's a very good question for me. Because when Be'er Sheba was abandoned, our kibbutz, Chatzarim, actually did take hold of two houses, and we created a cow shed and a carpentry shed, one beside each other. And they still exist in Be'er Sheba till this very day. And therefore, I cannot say that we explode. We actually demolished houses put explosives in them. On the contrary, Tnuva, the dairy 
um, industry created its branch there, for example, in Beersheba, and then from there they were distributed all over. Were there any explosions outside the town of Beersheba? I did not participate in, and I am not familiar with any having happened. Before you came into the town of Beersheba, there was an artillery aerial bombardment that took over a number took a number of days for a whole week. Did you know that? Did, do you know that before the conquering, the occupation of Beersheba, there was an aerial bombardment of uh, Beersheba? Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know. We s literally did not know about it. I don't know where you got that information from. And that, now you have... You now make me fancy really going and examining and investigating that. I am not familiar with that, and I haven't even heard about that. Avner has not asked, and therefore it's the last question. Definitely the last. In the 50s, were you witness to any displacement or, or expulsions of any Bedouins from the Negev in the 50s. In other words, after the conclusion of, of the War of Independence, were you at that time witness or are you familiar with any phenomena of expulsion or resettlement of people from the Negev, the residents, the inhabitants of the Negev. I personally do not know. I'm not familiar with that. I could personally have heard that on the radio, but not beyond that. So therefore, I cannot answer you whether it did happen or not. I do not know. So perhaps someone else is aware of it. Well, it's often. So often, we are truly grateful. Sufen. Sufen is his nickname. His name is Zalman Azi. That's his real name. Thank you very much.